This is the story of Final Fantasy XIV, Stormblood, Patch 4.1, The Legend Returns. Now we left off at the end of Stormblood, where Alamigo was liberated from the Garlean Empire. Let's get started. We've made good progress since we took back Alamigo, but there's one big issue we still have to address. In Malgar's Reach, Lise is concerned that Alamigo has no one to rule over it. She says Roban is in charge for now, and they will just have to solve problems by having a bunch of meetings until they can figure it out. Lise leaves Minago in charge, and Arnvald approaches, asking to speak to the hero in private. He says he wants to go on an adventure together, so a moment later, they meet with Alfino to get started. Arnvald explains that the Mad King Theodric, who ruled before Garlean occupation, killed a lot of people out of a paranoid fear of them taking the throne. There is a legend of the Mad King's Trove, where the stolen treasures from all these murdered people was hidden. Alfino asks about all the others who've already tried to find this bounty, but Arnvald insists it's worth a try and it's going to be fun, so the three of them agree to it. Arnvald has no leads to begin with, so Alfino suggests he browse the records seized from the Imperials while they ask elders who lived in that time. The hero gathers info around the Alamegan Quarter, and one man says the king used to have the victim's family members transformed into monsters and thrown beneath the palace. The hero and the other two reconvene to share what they've learned. Alfino came back empty-handed, while Arnvald says he heard of a prison beneath the palace. Alfino asks what Arnvald's real motivation is for seeking this treasure, and Arnvald gives a tale of his past. His father was a Garlean, and his mother Mother, Alamegan, and he was unwanted by his mother. She scarred his forehead with a knife believing he was developing a Garlean third eye, then abandoned him on the streets. He grew up as a criminal orphan and wants to do what he can to alleviate poverty in Alamigo. The others agree to this noble cause, and Alfino says he has a theory on where to look. He takes them to Lock Seld and says that during the 5th Astral Era, the city of Scala was here but it fell, and at the end of the 6th Astral Era, this long deserted city was flooded. Alfino theorizes that these flooded ruins are the darkness beneath the palace referenced in legend and the monsters he created were put there to keep people out, so it's likely this treasure trove was buried here. Alfino and Arnvald leave to explore the prisons while the hero dives deep underwater to the bottom of the lake. After some exploration, he finds an old stone door. On his link pearl, Alfino rings and says they found a magically concealed portal as well. Both parties agree to enter their respective doors. The hero enters the drowned city of Scala and encounters all manner of amphibious creatures and cave dwellers. Deep inside, at the golden walls of ruin, a magic door opens and he's attacked by a large monstrosity named Prodric Poisonton. <laughs> Without too much trouble, the hero slays the beast. A moment later, Alfino and Arnvald fall into the room from above. Ugh, bugger it. Ah, it seems both our paths led here. Very good. By the twelve, there is even more than I imagined. Oh, I can't wait to see the look on Lisa's face. Thanks for believing in me, you two. They return to Alamigo immediately to speak to Lise. She says she didn't even know the treasure was real and is very pleased with the plan to donate it to the city to help alleviate poverty. Just as that's settled, a soldier arrives breathless and says an angry mob is gathered in the city. Lise and the heroes run there right away. Step back, all of you! Like hells we will! We know who you've got in there! We're not leaving till you hand her over! What's going on? The mob is angry because Fordola is being held captive and they want her executed immediately. They start to turn their rage to Lise and accuse her of protecting a murderer, but Roban appears and interjects. Hearken to me, brothers and sisters of Alamigo. My friends, you are not alone in your anger, your grief, your despair, for it is mine as well. But I ask you, brothers and sisters, to think not only of the family and friends who are cut down before your very eyes, but to think also of the ones who were abducted, the ones who may yet live. Where were they taken? What became of them? These questions demand answers. After a few words, he appeals to their ethics. Now is the time that we, the people of Alamigo, must decide what manner of nation we will build for ourselves and for generations yet unborn. I say to you, it is our responsibility to give these prisoners a fair trial, that they might answer to all of Alamigo. The Galleons called us savages, and I'll be damned if we prove them right.
After the crowd disperses, Lise thanks Roban. Monago says that in other areas, civilians are attacking their neighbors who had previously worked with the Guardians. Lise says these are trying times, but she will pull it together before the upcoming meeting of leaders. Roban says the matter of Fordola must be settled before said meeting, as not to risk disrupting proceedings. The heroes enter her prison to have a word with her. They start to talk, but Fordola just wants to be executed. All of this is pointless! There's no reason to keep me alive, and you know it! You didn't come this far, climbing over the bodies of your own brothers and sisters just to piss it all away! As Arnvald talks to her, the hero has a vision. He sees Fordola as a child walking with her parents in Garlean-occupied Alamigo. Lord Gaius is a great and honorable man who looks after all of Alamigo. He's very busy, and if we don't hurry, we'll miss our chance to see him. Filthy tinhead lovers. A crowd begins to heckle Fordola's parents, calling them traitors and throwing stones. It's all right. It's all right. They don't understand, but they'll see in time. They'll see that this is the only way to survive. The savages have their fun. They'll be more compliant once they've tied themselves out. Fadola, please! You already have citizenship! Why would you want to become a soldier? Can't you see? Citizenship means nothing to them. If you're not a pure blood Galleon, you're no different from any other savage. So I'll play the part. I'll join the Legion and I'll make them respect me. And when the mob see that, they'll think twice before throwing their stones. It'll be hard, humiliating. They'll try to break us, send us crawling back to our own kind. But we won't, no matter what. We'll bleed for them, die for them if we have to. We'll do whatever it takes to be free! Been in my head, have you? Had a little peek at my past. Don't you dare patronize me! You don't know a god's damned thing about the life I've led! Fordola is then struck with a series of visions of the hero and his great deeds. Ah! The things they've done to you, the lies, the betrayal. The endless fighting. Yet there you stand. Unbroken. How? Why? You still have time, Fordola. Think about how you want to spend it. Let's go. Outside, the heroes discuss Fordola and decide to head to the research facility where she was granted the Echo artificially. At the facility, the hero inspects the equipment and speaks with Ironworks engineers who are analyzing the lab. They find that many people were killed here by having their ether forcibly extracted, but Kryle's pod was not built for extraction. Alfino concludes that they were recreating Kryle's Echo by monitoring her and stealing ether from other subjects. Her Echo was copied onto Fordola, who in turn is now feeling all the pain and suffering she's inflicted on those around her. Roban says they must continue to protect Fordola and learn all they can, as he fears the Garleans could create an entire legion of soldiers with the Echo. Lys agrees and they leave. Outside, Lise is concerned about how much they rely on Roban and feels incapable of leading. Pippin approaches and says the Sultana wishes to speak with the hero, so he heads back to Ulda. I thank you for answering my summons in these most interesting times. You have been busy. She talks about Roban, noting that while he's established a good life in Ulda, he will always be Alamegan at heart. He has committed to staying by the Sultana's side and she loves him for it, but isn't sure it's what he truly wants. Whether Raubon chooses to remain in Uldar or return to Alamigo, 
I only wish that he do so with a heart unburdened by guilt or regret. She then says she wants to travel her lands with the hero, but not as the Sultana, and he agrees. Allow me a moment to change into something a touch less conspicuous, and I will join you outside. The hero meets her in disguise on the streets. She says her false persona for traveling in disguise is Lilira, a merchant's daughter. They see the countryside and they see the refugees living in squalor. The Sultana reflects on her failures. They visit the Colosseum where the Sultana tells of how she met Raban. She unknowingly saved him from assassination and he pledged to one day serve her, though she didn't believe him. Five years later, he amassed enough money for his freedom and a seat on the syndicate, thus fulfilling his pledge. Just then, the hero is struck with a vision. In this vision, Roban effortlessly dispatches his foes as a gladiator in the Colosseum. Roban! Your grace. With your winnings, you have become one of the six most wealthy souls in all Ulda. And so, as tradition dictates, Robin Alden, you have earned yourself a seat on the Syndicate. May your new station garner you still greater glories. I am honored, Your Grace, and vow to serve with every fiber of my being from this day to my last. Long live the Sultana, and long live Ulda! Next, they visit the room that houses the Thaumaturgist Guild. She gazes upon the Shrine of Nald and hopes she has what it takes to lead her people well. She says many refugees are preparing to return home to Alamigo and she wants to help. Godbert Manderville is a syndicate member she trusts who has hired many refugees, so she wants to speak with him for advice. They head to the Gold Saucer to meet with him. At the Gold Saucer, Nanimo is excited by all the games but wishes to stay focused on the task. They meet with Godbert straight away, who welcomes them warmly. When she explains the situation and asks for advice, his response shocks her. He says she should not help them whatsoever as it does not benefit Ulda. He says her will to help is born of pity and a desire to save them, but unconditional charity will only create dependencies. Further, it would anger the poor remaining in Ulda. The Sultana takes his advice to heart and thanks him. He leaves and she asks the hero if he knows any successful merchants they could speak with. He mentions Hancock from Kugani, but since she doesn't have the time to travel so far, she asks the hero to go on her behalf. The hero makes his way to the Ruby Bazaar and speaks with Hancock. Hancock is flattered to be asked for advice from the Sultana, but he suggests they meet with Lolorito at the Waking Sands. Back in Ulda, the Sultana initially dislikes the idea, but decides it's for the best. The hero, the Sultana, and Lolorito meet to discuss a business proposal. Instead of simply handing out charity, the Sultana wants to make a mutually beneficial arrangement. Ah, <laughs> twould seem your grace has matured beyond acts of earnest yet misplaced charity. Pray tell me more. To summarize, in return for facilitating the repatriation of refugees and assisting in the establishment of new industry in Alamigo, you ask that a proportion of all subsequent profits be promised to Ulda. They discuss the saltery in Girabanya, a place that has room for refugees to settle as well as an abundance of salt for building an industry. Salt has ever been a transformative ingredient. And in this instance, I dare say, it could transform a modicum of effort into a mountain of gill. The local citizens will need to be consulted, of course, but I trust the East Aldenar Trading Company can be relied upon to provide its assistance in negotiating a mutually beneficial arrangement. He agrees and a deal is struck. The hero returns to Alamigo to update Lys. Alfino suggests Alamigo help fund the investment since they were just gifted a pile of treasure and this will ensure Lolorito doesn't have total control. They then proceed with the next step, consulting the locals. Whisker's grandfather lives at the Sultery, so they head that way. The grandfather is excited at the prospect of his town being brought back to life, but mentions the monsters that dwell near the lake. The hero and Whisker head there to improve Whisker's combat skills. Just as they return to his proud grandfather, a messenger arrives saying Pippin needs to speak with the hero. The hero leaves Alfino to tend to the Saltery and returns to Alamigo.
Roban and Pippin bring up Laurentius and Yuyuhase, the crystal braves who conspired with Ilbert and betrayed the Order a while back. Aye, well, it would seem they followed him all the way to the Wall. It was they who orchestrated the slaughter of the Resistance fighters prior to the Griffin's infernal ritual. They have been captured and will soon be receiving their judgment, but Roban has more to say so they go for a walk. Roban feels partially to blame for Ilbert's crimes, but is thankful that Alamigo is finally free. Which means my work here is done. Soon I will return to Uldar and take my place at the Sultana's side. He says part of him wishes to stay, but he will not betray his oath to the Sultana. After the walk, Arnvald says a group of Kalyana has arrived and they want to participate in the meeting of leaders. This is bad because they are the ones enthralled to Sri Lakshmi. They head to join Lys as she speaks with them. As a compromise, Lys allows them to participate in the meeting so long as they leave all crystals behind, even their jewelry. Once they're gone, Roban urges they take extra precautions so the other scions come along. Yishtola and Thancred agree to be on standby outside while the others attend the meeting. Thank you all for coming. I am Lise Hext, and I speak for the Resistance. Among you are village elders, refugee leaders, envoys from the Ananta and the Kikern. She draws the attention of everyone gathered to the empty throne and notes that no one wants to be king. She proposes that they sit together as equals and form a republic. Expertly done! Lise has removed monarchy as a choice early in the game, and positioned them to consider a joint government. Next, let's hear from Shanti of the Kalyana. Tell us, how do your people feel about the idea of a republic? The Ananta wish only that those who dwell within Gia Abania devote themselves to our faith. You shall all worship Sri Lakshmi! Inexplicably, she summons the primal right there in the throne room. This can't be happening. No crystals were allowed through the door. We can worry about the how of it later. We need to evacuate these people right now, or the primal will make thralls of them all. Arnvald and the hero, being the only two possessing the echo, charge in while the others flee. Being outnumbered, Lys has a wild idea and runs off. Yeah, whatever she's about, she best make it quick. The hero faces the primal Sri Lakshmi once again, but with Arnvold by his side. <gasps> what of it? Do you want to kill this thing or not? Together they slay the primal. Then the hero looks at Fordola and has a vision. Lise tells her a primal has been summoned and they need someone with the echo to help. I told you before that you still had time, but things have changed. I need your answer now. You can end it like Xenos, or you can fight for Alamigo. Your choice. Once the primal is gone, the other leaders return and are shocked to see Fordola. Immediately, she is bombarded with visions of their suffering at her hands. It's done. Take me back to my cell. Ragenfrid from Alagana says she is not forgiven, but he thanks her. For standing against a primal and saving us from servitude. You have my thanks.
In the aftermath, Lise blames herself for the summoning, but Roban says they were all caught unawares. They found that some of the guards were enthralled ahead of time and conspired with the Kaliana, so Yashtola offers to identify them for investigation. Lise says going forward, the people need to be taught a better way forward than vengeance, or else another generation of skulls will rise up. She reconvenes the meeting with Roban's protection and asks the Scions to rest. That night, Roban and the hero speak alone. The meeting is over. The envoys have chosen to instate a government modeled on Ishgard's House of Commons, a ruling body of representatives elected by the people. The hero steps aside so the Sultana can approach and speak with Roban in private. Your Grace, I... there was no word. Rabon Aldin, you are hereby dismissed as General of the Immortal Flames and relieved of your seat on the Syndicate. But... Your Grace... She tells him to stay and rebuild his homeland. Did you think me oblivious to the anguish in your eyes when you spoke of returning to Uldar? For years and years, we have trusted one another. Yet now you refuse to confess your heart's desire? I swore an oath to you that day on the sands. I pledged my sword. She says he's done a fine job, but it's time for him to be at home. So follow your heart, please. You are home. You are free. None no more. I... <sighs> Smile for me, Raubarn. I would have this parting be a joyous one. Thank you, Your Grace. It has been an honor to serve you and Ulda. The hero returns to Lise and the others. Thanks for shielding us from Lakshmi, you two. If you hadn't been there, the rest of us would be worshipping her by now. Alfino mentions that he ran into the Sultana here in town. Are you in the habit of gossiping about the affairs of royalty, Master Leveilleur? Certainly not, Your Grace. I, I was merely informing my companions. Be at ease, Alfino. It was only a jest. But I must yield the floor to Raubon. He has an important announcement to make. He says he's no longer in the Syndicate of Ulda, nor leading the Immortal Flames, but Pippin will take his place. So, does this mean you're staying? Aye. That seems to be the way of it. I would be glad to aid you in rebuilding our nation, if you'll have me. If, he says. Welcome home, Raubarn. Alamigo will rejoice at the homecoming of her dearest son. Lee says it's time to return to Raugr's Reach and the heroes join her. Back in Raugr's Reach, Alice is impressed by all the tales of what happened while she was healing. Lee talks about the challenge of dealing with all the citizens crying out for vengeance and tensions with the beast tribes. She then says Roban will be the commander of all resistance forces, which will now become the army of Alamigo. With the development of a salt industry and an army led by a military master, Alamigo has a promising future. Meanwhile, Gosetsu has found his way back to Kugani, but with no money, his future is uncertain. Yatsuyu approaches, offering Dengo a delicious treat. She sits next to him and eats happily like a child. Gosetsu says they must cross the Ruby Sea, and Yatsuyu follows. In the Imperial Palace, soldiers speak about how Xenos is not dead, merely wounded. And patch 4.1 ends there. If you want to see what happens next, check out the story video for patch 4.2. See you next time. <laughs>